I'm Igor Kafetz, and this is The List Building Lifestyle, a podcast for anyone who wants to build a wildly profitable email list working from home. If you'd like to make six figures, travel the world, and help people improve their lives in the process, then this podcast is for you. I also invite you to attend a free workshop at igor.ac where I'm teaching how I made $21,779.45 in affiliate commissions by sending just 481 clicks to my affiliate link in one day. I'm also explaining why I walked away from ClickBank and I don't promote ClickBank offers anymore, as well as the five things I look for in the perfect affiliate offer. I'm even going to show you the one-page website that I used to make over half a million dollars in affiliate commissions this year, and I'll even bribe you to attend this workshop by giving you a $497 value course that shows you how to cherry-pick high-converting affiliate offers for your next affiliate promotion. In addition, I'll even give you the three offers I'm promoting right now that are making me money as we speak. All that and more at igor.ac. And now, it's time to claim your list building lifestyle. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, list builders of all ages, my name is Terrence Lackey. I am your co-host, along with Igor Kfeds, and this is the List Building Lifestyle Show. Hello, Igor. How are you doing today? Hey, Terrence. I'm doing great. Uh, you know, we had a really good week here in Toronto. It's been really hot to a point where I was just missing snow. You know, it was really hot and humid. Yeah. Oh, man. I, I, I can't imagine what hot and humid means in Toronto. I know down here in Florida, we're hitting our, uh, our, our annual thunderstorms. So we're starting to get those evening thunderstorms and the humidity is, is crazy. But, you know, I love the sunshine. It's kicking out right now. So uh, I can't complain. You know, really, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy we're hitting into summer, even though the, the beach is going to be a little restricted. Uh, it's the best, my favorite time of the year to get in the pool and swim around. Yeah, I don't know. Florida is uh, just a, a tad too much for me as far as humidity, <laughs> humidity goes. It's really humid. It's like I am in the shower all day long, you know, with clothes, with, you know, shoes and everything. It's just really, it's really difficult for me to exist there. Like when, when we uh, went to uh, Disney World a couple of years ago. Whoa, man, this is bad. And you know what's interesting? And I don't mean to sound disrespectful to uh, to the people who live in Florida or anything like that. But the first time I went to Florida, it was back in 2014. And um, the first thing I noticed, that was my first trip to to United States ever, right? And I'm coming from a Middle East, Eastern country. So I'm coming to Florida. I think it was Orlando. And I'm like, wow, people are big here. They're huge. Like a, a, a big guy in Israel... Is about one third the size of a big guy in Florida, or maybe in the states altogether, but you know Florida specifically. And I was like, how do these people survive in such a hot and humid, uh, you know, rainforest-like environment? Like, why don't people just die? Because I felt like dying the first couple of days. You know, jet lag <laughs> and humidity. I was like, I was ready to go. Yeah, you know, it takes getting used to. You have to get acclimated. But you know what? Here's the danger with that. You get acclimated to Florida or any of these southern states uh, or anywhere, you know, in the south, uh, and you head north. Uh, if I go to Toronto in the winter, I, first of all, I only have one coat, and I don't even know if it's still, I think the zipper's broken on it. So, uh, you know, down here in Florida, people are wearing a scarf and a, a hoodie and a, uh, you know, um, a, a beanie cap and everything when it when it hits about 50 degrees. And that's, you know, the dead of winter is dropping down in the 40s and maybe upper 30, uh, you know, not even upper 30s, the 40s. So you th- your, 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 your blood really thins out. So, man, I tell you what. Hey, listen, I'm glad to talk to you. We haven't talked in a while, and I'm really pumped to have our conversation today about um, about the – well, I guess we're going to call it the – don't mess with Texas anti-littering campaign, which I think is a fantastic uh, thing to talk about. Would you want to get us started on that? Yeah, you know, this is one of the most um, famous now advertising campaigns in history. In fact, it won the Medicine Avenue Walk of Fame um, award and, and uh, got inducted into the Advertising Hall of Fame on Madison wow. Avenue as well. It was that successful. And it started out as a anti-littering campaign. That's all it was. It was just, you know, Texas, the state of Texas, trying to um, minimize littering, 
right? So people are throwing things out of their trucks and, you know, there was garbage everywhere. And, you know, they, the first attempt that, that they made was, you know, stop littering. You know, they would put up signs and, uh, and uh, air TV commercials. They would basically say, hey, preserve nature or stop littering or, you know, let's take care of our state. But none of them worked. There was literally no effect. And even if it was, it was so insignificant that, that you couldn't really measure it. So what they did is, I don't know if they hired someone for it or not, maybe just uh, smart people in the in the city hall. What they've done is they approached all the Texas, um, you know, all the Texas born or Texas bred uh, celebrities, you know, people like, uh, I think, Willie Nelson and Steve Ray Vaughan and uh, George Foreman or, or something like that. Basically, a bunch of people who are recognizable by football players and, you know, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure Dallas, uh, you know, NBA team, um, maybe. And um, in San Antonio, obviously, they got a big team, too. And so they ran a series of commercials that basically said, mamas, tell your, uh, tell your kids not to mess with Texas or something to the point of like, don't mess with Texas. And that's why it's called the Don't Mess with Texas Anti-Littering Campaign, because when someone like Willie Nelson, um, you know, uh, encourages you and, 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 and offers this call to arms, let's like, let's protect our state, which is something like if you're a southerner, um, this resonates with you, right? Because there's just a the mentality over there. Um, people went with it to a point where uh, they cut littering by by a big margin. So margin so noticeable that uh, it's now considered to be one of the most successful campaigns ever. And the idea behind the campaign, the reason it was very successful, is because it appealed to the identity of the people who are considered to be what we would call the target market. I could see that for sure. You know, I used to live in San Antonio myself for a number of years, and the, the, the amount of pride that, that Texans have uh, about where they're from and their state is just kind of off the charts when compared to some of the other states. So tapping into that pride to get an outcome um, that you want, which is anti-littering, I, that's brilliant. I, I can see why the first one didn't work, and then I could definitely see why the second one was successful. Hmm. Yeah, it's, it's nuts. When you write copy um, or when you create any sort of advertising or marketing material, um, you know, they, they say you should write to your avatar. You probably heard that before, right? Come up with this, whoever it is your ideal customer. You know, it's Mary from Texas. She goes to church, or church every Sunday. You know, she, uh, the, you know, uh, she makes, uh, she's a nurse and, you know, she has a little bit of money saved up, but she's not rich and she drives an old uh, Ford pickup truck. And like, so you, you, you basically come up with this identity or this persona. And what I see people do is, uh, first off, the, the most common mistake is they don't consider who they're writing to at all. They don't consider who they're creating marketing for at all. And that is why their marketing simply doesn't hit. It doesn't register. It, it basically is noise that is automatically um, trashed or discarded or brushed aside because it, it doesn't seem relevant. There's absolutely zero relevance about, you know, what they produce. But the other part of it, the few people who do actually consider who is going to be the person on the other end of that marketing message, they only focus on this demographical stuff. It's like, oh, they're 35 years old and they're male and they are living in Texas. But that's not enough. The real, the true uh, sales producing stuff or... or I would say the juice, right? The juice is in identity of the people you're marketing to. Now, of course, we can argue about that people in Texas, their identity is different than people in Florida. I get that. But I'm pretty sure that fundamentally, when you're marketing a product of some kind, you will be marketing to an identity uh, related to the product. So if you're marketing to people uh, looking to... Um, you know, people had a heart attack, for example, and they're looking to prevent the next heart attack or they're looking to get their heart back in shape, right? We can probably guess that the identity of those people would be, at the very least, um, you know, they're older, right? So if they're older, uh, they, uh, they um, trust doctors. They uh, maybe don't believe as much into alternative medicine. Uh, maybe... 
uh, they are uh, the opposite, right? Maybe it's the kind of market that actually is into alternative medicine and therefore anything that a quote unquote a, a typical doctor says they don't believe. Okay, so there's like market research that has to be done about the way they perceive the world, the way they make decisions, the way they uh, accept or reject a claim of any kind, right? Because you couldn't be making a claim about a mineral that you should be taking to uh, make your heart muscle uh, stronger, to which they can either respond with, yeah, right, basically saying something like heart muscle is heart muscle is heart muscle, which means whatever heart muscle I was born with, that's the heart muscle I got. Or maybe they say something like, uh, well, my mother had a, had a heart attack and her mother had a heart attack and her mother had a heart attack. So I'm pretty much like heart attacks run in my family. So that's this is it. This was my problem with losing weight. And I think I told this, uh, uh, told this story like when we just started the podcast, like I went on for years and years and years convinced because that's what my parents told me. I, I guess they were trying to protect my feelings that I was born to a fat father who had a fat mother who had, um, you know, and he had a fat sister too. And that's why I'm fat because it, it just runs in the family. I got the fat gene, you know. The reality was my diet sucked. I didn't exercise. I consumed lots of sugar. But, you know, I seem to ignore the fact that my brother is skinny and my mom is skinny. Somehow, though, that idea that, yep, I've got the fat gene, I mean, that was it. And you see, you couldn't get me to buy anything related to weight loss until and unless you convinced me that fat people, right, can lose weight. And you know what happened there? You know how I uh, got that idea? I'm sitting here with bated breath because I, I, I'm, I'm interested in losing weight myself. So what, what, how'd you get that idea? Honestly, I was just watching The Biggest Loser. Do you remember that show? Yeah, I do remember that show. I love that show, actually. I love that show, too, because the transformation of someone being really, really, really fat, like we're talking people who weigh like almost 300 pounds, right? There were like some big people there, both men and women. And looking at them and seeing how they become these ripped and fit individuals over a course of time um, and the struggle they go through and how they change diet, they change uh, exercise regimen, they really work their asses off, but they lose a lot of weight. And looking at them, Terrence, I'll be honest, I felt, I felt kind of ashamed that I've only had an extra maybe 25, maybe 30 pounds compared to what these guys had. My you know, the work I had to put in to lose that that much weight wasn't nearly as aggressive as the work they had to put in. But seeing them uh, lose weight overcame the sort of it, it, it basically allowed me to override the idea of the fat gene. And yeah. I'm really grateful to whoever created that show um, and whoever in Israel decided to buy the rights to air the show, uh, you know, so yeah. I could finally see it. And it was it was uh, one of the most inspiring shows uh, of the decade for me at the time. It shattered those limiting beliefs. So the things that you thought were real it turned out to be completely false when you had uh, when you had that example that took you somewhere else and told you it could really be done. I I, I love that show because it it really kind of it was like always a happy ending because these people got healthier, they got fitter, they got more attractive, uh, and all because of hard work and. Uh, you know, I, I've seen that. I've heard that as you know from from people along along the way in my life that, you know, there are reasons for this and reasons for that. My my family, it runs in my family, or I'm big boned, or I have thyroid problems, and maybe there are medical conditions. But um, yeah. It's a, so what we're talking about in relation to our business is that there. Yeah. How does it relate to our business? So because we we how we frame our copy. Um, we lead the, uh, let me take a stab at it. We're going to lead our avatar to the conclusion that we want to point out to them, right? Am I, am I on the right track? Well, it all comes down to identity. We need to really carefully consider the identity of the people that we're looking to attract. Yo, it's Igor. If you're loving the content, hop on over to lizbillinglifestyleshow.com for more free training and a free transcript of this episode. Oh, and I'd really appreciate if you logged into iTunes and rated the show. It really helps. Thanks. Let's take a more obvious example, uh, such as make money online, right? So anyone who listens to this podcast is probably interested in making money online. So 
on the some fundamental level, we can probably make a few assumptions. Assumption number one, even if you do have a job right now, you may not want to keep that job forever. Even if you have that job right now, it doesn't mean you like the job. And if you like the job, it doesn't mean that that job pays the bills to a point where, you know, uh, you, you need it to pay the bills. So these are some assumptions about the people who are taking interest in affiliate marketing programs and in, in Shopify programs, how to start an online business programs, etc. Another value and an and identity piece that we can assume is that these people put high value on making money. You know, there's people out there who just enjoy the process. They want to see some money come in. They may not even be doing this because they really want to be a business owner. They just want to have another source of income for one reason or another. For some of them, it's an emotional reason of just making money happen. You know, there's people who enjoy that. Uh, for others, it's about the freedom. They want. Uh, they don't want to have a, a one source of income. They want to have multiple streams of income. For someone else, it's about the fear. The fear that they may lose their job tomorrow because they had a job before and they got fired unexpectedly. Uh, for someone else, it's about recognition. Maybe they don't get the recognition they want in their job. So what they do is they build a job for themselves where they can get all the recognition they want. You know, for me, when I was working in the hotel and scrubbing basically toilets, um, there was no recognition. Although, you know, it's the it's the... Uh, we'll call them uh, the hospitality industry workers. You know, they work really hard. I don't work nearly as hard today as I used to work back then. But today I'm making like 300 times more money per month than I used to make back then. So it's kind of crazy how that ratio completely flipped on its head. Um, but, you know, the people who toil the hardest, they get the least recognition. And, you know, I hated that. Besides the money, of course, uh, the money aspect was kind of obvious. But, uh, you know, if my boss would just tell me more often that he appreciates my work, I may not have left so soon. You know what I mean? Like, because all, all this guy did, his name was Jonathan, he just yelled at me all day long. Like, every single tiny little mistake, he would yell at me. And anything that I would do well, it would be just, uh, okay. And there was no recognition be beyond that. It was expected. It was never recognized. And, uh, you know, a lot of times I also saw recognition go to someone else uh, for things that, you know, weren't that impressive in the first place. Why? Because, you know, Jonathan was originally from India. And he, he had this thing. He would reward and advance people who were also originally from India, typically from his community. There were a couple of, uh, couple of girls, actually, that he did it for who were just bad they 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 did a bad job and yeah they got recognition and he advanced them so that kind of made me realize yeah i'm not gonna get that recognition here i'm gonna hustle and i'm gonna build my own business and i'm gonna get what i'm worth and you know the aspect that i really like about internet marketing and it's no secret um it's the ego boost you get from people really literally buying you or, or uh, people wanting to work with you and not someone else. Uh, there's a powerful ego boost in that for me. And I'm sure for any other quote unquote guru, right? Although I try to distance myself from the term, but I guess for, for many people, I do seem like a guru. And, you know, that was a part of what pulled me into this industry. I could have said, you know what, I'm just going to start a Shopify brand and I'm going to sell underwear, you know, and be this invisible uh, person, no one knows, but I'm like making six figures selling underwear on the internet. I, but I never wanted to be that. I would much rather have my face on a book. And uh, when when people ask me what I do, I would say I'm a best selling author. You know that it gives you much more pleasure and satisfaction than saying you know I just make six figures. So all these different identity plays, all these different identity reasons and uh, ways of thinking, and uh, they are really important. If you don't know, like when they say know your customer, that's what they mean. It's not about their age or their demographic. It's about behavior and identity more than anything else. So, so knowing their motivations, their frustrations, their desires, their hopes, their dreams, these are all things that you can tap into in order to resonate with them. And resonating would be the, the, the key. That's the goal, 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 goal with the, the holy grail is to, to become in sync 
with what they're trying to achieve and the fears, the frustrations, the desires and hopes and dreams that they're they're trying to achieve. So, uh, yeah, I, I could see that definitely. And some of those scenarios you painted are, are you know, they, I think everybody can almost relate to those because I certainly can. I know that my experience with people in, in jobs and in, in occupations is that you really don't work for companies. You work for people. And regardless of what the company is, it can be the best company in the world. But if the, the guy that uh, you report to or the, the gal that you report to is a jerk or doesn't recognize your hard work and effort, then that's that's going to be your vision of what that what that company is. And sometimes they will really disappoint you. Sometimes they're great. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, once you, uh, you know, working for yourself and uh, in, in customizing your lifestyle and your and your experience uh, the way you want to is always what we're shooting for, even if we're working for someone else or for ourselves. So uh, I, I can definitely see that as an approach towards uh, getting your marketing message out there. Yeah, this plays out in everything we do. And, and because of that, good copy or good marketing feels almost like mind reading because it taps into those things you never admit to other people. So to me, anytime I'm sitting down with a client or uh, somebody writes me an email and shares their feedback about a webinar they attended or a podcast episode they listened to or an email they, they read, and they sort of retell me a story that I told or, or, or they say how something that I said resonated with them, usually that's how I know that I'm on the right track because if it resonates to a point where they would write to me to tell me about it, looking for that additional connection, that means that I hit really deep. And when you hit deep with your copy, um, you know, it, it's no longer like you're not even competing in the same space as, as other product, you know, uh, marketers. You're basically standing out from that point. Your voice stands out in a very noisy uh, internet crowd if you will, right? And again, it plays out in every area of our life. It plays out in every relationship you have. It plays on every marketing promotion in the people you work with, people you will hire. Uh, it plays out in everything we do. And I really didn't recognize that. Like, I failed to see that many times before. For example, I had a best friend, Max, who's no longer a best friend, unfortunately, who um, at one point I wanted like he was one of the few people I trusted because I figured, hey, he's my best friend, so I might as well trust him with my business. And I uh, kind of taught him how to operate my business. Uh, what I didn't realize is that Max's values were way off, right? He did not had uh, he did not have a value of hard work. He was actually quite lazy, and he could work intensely for three days, but then he would like take a take a two-day slump after that, which I needed to kick him out of every time. Or he would actually not have a value of, if it needs to be done, um, I have to get it done, you know, uh, by hook or by crook or whatever the saying is, right? He, if, if, because he had the mindset of, if it needs to be done, but I'm tired, I'm not going to get it done. You know, that was it. <laughs> that was Max's value. And I knew these values. I, I mean, I knew Max for a really long time, but, um, but I ignored that. And I thought that I'm going to change him by, by just showing him how, how I do things and for him kind of looking at me and doing the same. Wasn't the case. The values were just not there. And no matter the techniques I used or, or how many times I fought with him about it or, you know, how I tried to incentivize him to do a better job, it didn't matter because the values would drive the decisions and that would drive everything else. So that was a big lesson for me to shift everything I do to a value-driven decision-making with regards to people, right? Especially people I hired over the years and obviously fired, as well as JV partners, as well as customers, right? Because now I, I market uh, not using claims but using values. Any, any claim I would make, I would actually appeal to a value rather than some sort of like surface-level desire, which, you know, explains why we can take someone who literally comes across our work like yesterday and today convert them into a thousand dollar sale because we appeal at a such level so deep that the connection is instant and is and the bond is really powerful so all we have to do after that we just 
we have to not violate the bond. If we violate it, yeah, we lose the customer. But if we don't, if we continue on the same wavelength, uh, then it becomes an amazing business. Not because of the money, but because of the bond with the customer. Like I was just speaking to a customer of mine today, and uh, he's a fellow immigrant, I believe. And if he's not, I apologize. But, you know, he's a fellow immigrant who lives uh, here in Markham, not far from me. And I'm an immigrant, right? So we really connected because our mindset was the same. Like this guy did not come to the call and say, Igor, I only have $20 to my name. How can I, uh, you know, what's the button I need to push to make a million dollars online? He came in very serious. He came in saying, hey, I allocated $40,000 to build my business. I'm, uh, I'm already like halfway through the program. I done this, I spoke to this lead bank, I've negotiated my $3 per lead uh, deal. And he's like asking really good questions. You can tell the guy's hardworking guy, which is a, uh, a quality all immigrants share in common. Because if you're an immigrant, you literally have to work your ass off because doors get closed in your face and people are at, at face value, people take you as a tire kicker or whatever. Like I've been an immigrant in two different countries throughout my life. Uh, starting when I was a teenager and then later on when I was a grown-up. And to this day, I'm being uh, brushed aside just because I have a Russian-sounding name and a face of someone who, like, grew up in Chechnya or something, right? People really do make these judgment calls, but the values, right? The values is what's important. So um, I highly recommend, if you're marketing anything right now, really ask yourself, Am I appealing to the strongest values of my target market? And if not, how can I do that? Okay. Well, listen. So it's appealing to the the strongest values of where where they where they are, where they come from, identifying your avatar, understanding their struggles and fears and aspirations, and then appealing to those in your copy. It seems to be the key to, to actually getting read and, and actually, uh, what, getting conversions or getting actions, desirable actions at the end of the day. So, so that, that's definitely, definitely something I'm going to put down in my playbook. Now, when we talked about, uh, you know, having this conversation, you did send me over a couple of resources I thought were pretty interesting. Do you want to talk about those? Yeah, absolutely. So if you want uh, to really get more ideas and more examples of um, what to do with your marketing, how to make it more memorable, how, how to make it more hard hitting, I highly recommend reading uh, Made to Stick, Why Some Ideas Survive and Others Die by Cheap Chip and Dan Heath. Uh, it's a really good book. They have another one, but I don't recommend that as much. Uh, Made to Stick, that's a, an amazing book for marketers. It offers lots of examples. It offers uh, quite a few principles that you can follow. They're not like as obvious. They don't go as deep. But just the examples alone are enough to make you realize, um, you know, these concepts that if you just, you know, do a half as good job uh, to incorporate these concepts into your marketing, you, you will see a bump in sales immediately. Well, excellent. Excellent. I'll make sure that we get a link of that on the listbuildinglifestyleshow.com along with the transcript. So make sure you, you swing by there and check it out. Um, man, Igor, this is a, it's been a great conversation. I really enjoyed it. I think, uh, I think I got a lot out of it and I think our, our list builders will as well. Um, I think we are going to wrap up this show. Do you have any final words? about this topic, about the uh, resonating with your audience and, uh, and learning how to motivate and, and get ideas that stick uh, and get them to take action on your copy? Yeah, absolutely. You know, th there's one thing that we said before, but I don't think we say it nearly as often as we should. Conversion, uh, be it, you know, a sale conversion, if you will, con but conversion is a religious term. Um, conversion to get someone to part with money is to first appeal to that sense of identity is to convert those ideas is to have them buy into the, your way of thinking so if your copy does a good job of that if your copy already enters that conversation on the same level and uh, the customer realizes you share the same values you're going to have a much easier time building your business and you're going to build a really cool customer base 
And I mean, uh, when I say cool, I mean uh, people that you would be happy to hang out with, people who uh, you will not be embarrassed to share your address with so they can swing by, right? You, you, you're literally looking at uh, the difference between making, uh, generating customers who, who you hate and generating customers who you love. That's, and of course, the money will be different too. So uh, again, I just want to remind you that uh, what we do here is not making claims on a website. We are in the business of truly being able to walk a mile in the other person's shoes. We are in the business of connection more than anything else. So the moment you can connect through values, that's the moment you stop wondering, you know, why, why am I not getting any sales? Because sales are going to stop, start coming in. A business through connection, principles and values, the secret to a lasting business. Well, this has been a great conversation. Thank you, Igor. Thank you, List Builders, for tuning in. We look forward to seeing you on the next show. Thank you for listening to the List Building Lifestyle. Get access to previous episodes, the transcription of today's show, as well as other exclusive content at lisbelinlifestyleshow.com. Also, don't forget to claim your free seat at the workshop I'm hosting this week, where I showed the two-step system that made me the top affiliate for people like Matt Basak, John Cristani, Richard Legg, Michael Cheney, and many, many others. In fact, on this workshop, I'm going to show you the exact approach I take whenever I promote an affiliate offer, the exact offers I promote, as well as how I was able to make over half a million dollars in commissions using my small list of just 18,000 people promoting a weird type of product that almost no one else promotes. All that is yours at igor.ac. So go ahead, claim your seat right now, and I'll see you there.